Encrypted Classic Horror with Jasper Lestrange. Tales of horror, mystery, and suspense. <laughs> <laughs> he woke up from the dream, panting, dry-lipped, with miserable eyes. As yet, he was but half awake, and his mind was still steeped in all the sweet entrancement of the night. He could see a face, vague now and shadowy, yet dear, too, through that glamorous haze of sleep with the terrible dearness of the remote and the illusory. Before he woke, he would try to work back to that place where he had met her, would try to snatch a few moments of queer, shimmering heaven from the hard and worthless day that threatened. Let him get her clear before him again, in all the passionate intimacy of dream. Oh, if he could but do it. It did not mean so much her face that had bewitched him. Nothing so definite as a face, perhaps, could make one cry and cry in ecstasy of longing. It was some strange enchantment that vanished in the daylight and could not be recalled. Those dream moments pulsed with a desolating sweetness, poignant, heartbreaking, ineffable. Yet let him get some poor idea of what she had been like. Let him but see her, just that once again. So, feverishly, half awake, he battled, crying to see her just that once again. A woman, with the knowledge of good and evil, who understood him, looking at him calmly with deep, clear eyes. A broad forehead, he thought it serene and noble as a goddess's, and above it, golden bronze wisps of hair, that trembled in the breeze and light. They had kissed, secretly, and some faint suggestion of sweet guilt and a smothered <laughs> laugh breaking from her lips made a great hot wave of passion overwhelm him. Something in her smiling, sun-browned face with those curls of burnished bronze and the wet, alluring scarlet of the mouth seemed half mocking, half compassionate. Dimly, he seemed able to remember whole days of dalliance, where she had been kind, viewing his mad desire with an easy tolerance, almost a maternal pity. It was not that he wanted, anything but that. He was more than half awake now, and the vision was slipping from him. Quickly he became conscious of the details of the furniture of his bedroom, of the unwelcome light streaming in through the windows, of, yes, of someone knocking to rouse him. He sat up. He dressed absent-mindedly, neglecting such things as the set of his tie and the grooming of his hair. Not that that was unusual. Failing any special stimulus, he was prone to avoid even very slight exertion. It was an ingrained habit now, bred perhaps of a morbid, energy-destroying introspection, perhaps too of a real monotony in his life. People called him a slacker, and his doctor, who visited him once a week, seemed to find him interesting but contemptible. Brisk young men with forceful, clear-cut faces, very modern, very confident, saw worthlessness written all over him. Supersensitive, he felt their reproach, and pitifully acquiesced in it. He felt himself degenerate. Little things showed which way the mind blew, a general lassitude always enveloping him, premature boldness, and a disposition in his wrists to become suddenly damp and clammy when he walked uphill. Now, as he had his breakfast, he answered his sister's remarks with more than his usual preoccupation. The exotic glamour of his dreams still held his mind, and still he was thinking, thinking fixedly of the dim, twilight country of the night, 
and of the strangely smiling face that he had seen. It was, above all, the necessity of expression that tortured him. He was panting under the longing to conserve this experience that had come to him, to perform the first duty of the artistic cell. Throughout the day it was the same. He used to spend his time partly in long and lonely walks, partly in his work of illustrating magazines. In this latter employment he had gained some considerable success. Sufficient, indeed, with a patrimony of a hundred a year to keep his sister and himself quite comfortably in a cottage near the Downs. Now he was sitting, pencil in hand, striving to catch the elusive charm before it vanished. His sister, Amabel, came in. How goes it, Claudie? she asked brightly, with a sympathetic glance at the bowed figure. He grunted. As usual, here's the last hour's work. He made a motion towards the virgin sheets before him. Often and often had she seen him sit like this, pursuing shadows, gazing sullenly at the wall or out of the window, with the paper white and blank upon the board. Then indeed he wrestled, but often to no purpose. Excusing him, she would remind herself that the effort of self-expression, when it is sincere, is the hardest, the most strenuous toil in which man can engage, when it is sincere. They had tea together, and then Claude went alone for a walk along the downs. Still the face haunted him. With the artist's instinct, or infirmity, he posed the woman of his dreams in the setting of the scenery around him. Just where he was walking, indeed, the view was none too romantic. He was ascending a path, leading past an old fever hospital and the corporation waterworks, to a stretch of wasteland that gave place later to some private gallops, the property of the lord of the manor. He was deeply preoccupied and hardly paid attention to the direction in which he was walking. Yet his steps followed one another with the steady, sure succession of one pursuing a well-known course. When presently he came to a turning, he took the path to the right, without a moment's hesitation. Now the path became a rough, chalky track that wound gently aslant the sloping side of a rolling down. In the valley below was a sheepfold, tightly packed. Up from it, in the clear air of evening, rose the dreamy, multitudinous tinkle of the bells, and presently the track ended in a cul-de-sac. The place where it disappeared was a somewhat evil locality, where rank bramble hemmed in a little depression in the down, and flies buzzed heavily about the lush grass. On a hot afternoon, the air would be stifling as the breath of a laundry, and the land would seem to gasp, feverish and impure. Claude paused and looked curiously about him. Whatever did I come here for, he was saying to himself, when suddenly something seemed to strike upon his brain. What was it? A momentary loosening of what had once been tense, an instantaneous resolution of what had been obscure, something like a flash of strangely wakened memory. He turned aside and looked up the path in the direction from which he had come. The figure of the dream woman was becoming plainer in his mind. Yes, but how changed? He gasped. The evanescent glamour of dream had disappeared and left. A woman, indeed, and pretty, but a woman with the coarse prettiness of a stained and cheapened soul. It might well have been one of the village girls, of whose debased loves this place was like as not the witness. Again he gazed around him, and a feeling of nausea overcame him. The obscene little valley, full of gross suggestion, revolted him. He turned his back on it, and walked quickly up the path. He soon gained the top of the down, and after a moment's hesitation decided to return home by the way he had come. 
The change from the still oppression of the valley to the fine, vigorous air of the hill was delightful. Striding rapidly along, he felt his whole being become cleansed and vivified, and an accustomed elation seemed for the instant to add spring and rhythm to his steps. Coming back, he was overtaken by his doctor, who came out of the gates of the fever hospital in his car. Claude accepted the little man's offer of a lift, and they were soon spinning smoothly and silently along. "'You're looking better today?' said the doctor, in a tone of brisk professionalism. Exercise is the thing. I see you've been having some lately. Now you were really seedy the last time I gave you a lift down this way. Claude made no reply. In the fading light he had the fleeting impression that the doctor was looking at him sideways, from the corner of an alert and curious eye. As he got out of the car and said good night, he asked himself, now, when did the little crank give me a lift before? I half remember. That first night on which he saw the dream woman and tried to make paper and pencil record something of her fascination hung for some time in his mind as an uneasy memory. Fresh air and exercise did something to lift him out of morbid introspection. But there were still bad times, and cold baths and long tramps lost their saving power, and all the good work seemed to be undone. In the evening an unhealthy exultation would sometimes come upon him, and he would grow excited, flushed and feverish. Or in the morning, languorous, enervating visions would float luxuriously before him, and he would give himself up to them, half gladly, half ashamedly, as to some illicit joy. Strangely enough, he connected these bad times with the haunting woman of his dreams. It was about a fortnight later that he saw her again. He awoke in the morning, the same face, beautiful and mocking, <laughs> set before him. There, as he looked at it, it seemed to be steeped in pensive light, and the bronze gold of its clustering curls moved gently in the breeze. A peculiar sadness, almost a reproach, dwelt in the eyes. Once the lips moved, talking. Again Claude, wrestling and battling with himself, sat in his workroom after breakfast, striving to portray the face that haunted him. A poet would have sought to envisage the ineffable in verse. A composer might have agonised his passion into terms of sound. The artist was driven as surely to the one mode of expression that lay open. This time he felt the task come easier. The face that had so baffled all his efforts at the first attempt now seemed a little less vague and impossible of transcription. Claude wondered whether this were due merely to a lessening of the ideal. He opened a drawer, and taking from it his previous trials, compared them with what he had just drawn. Both were infinitely disappointing, yet of the two the later drawn was certainly the clearer. A curious feeling came upon him, and a perplexed expression passed over his face. Turning his eyes away from the drawings, he looked out of the window, his brows knit in mental effort. It was no doubt a passing fancy, but for a moment he could almost swear that the faces on the paper were somehow linked up with a forgotten previous experience. He had the baffling sense of strain and tension that sometimes accompanies a supreme attempt at recollection. He turned to the drawing again and, taking up his pencil, began somewhat idly to sketch new lines into the shadowy background. Once more he wondered why this face took such hold upon his imagination. He had seen it but twice or thrice in his dreams, yet even now, in a relatively calm and sober moment, his whole being thrilled in ecstasy before it. Dreamily he asked himself what it was in the flowing, somewhat sensuous lines of the face that appealed to him with such overwhelming power. It was a pity he was so dead tired that morning. With a little more energy he might have finished the thing, 
but he had risen as little refreshed as if he had not slept. Yes, a peculiar thing was happening. As he was thus drowsily puzzling, his pencil was mechanically passing over the paper before him. Presently the preoccupied artist awoke from his reverie and looked down. A startled exclamation escaped him. The background, which before had been vague and nebulous, was now filled in with some clearness. What was more, it seemed strongly to suggest some place that he had seen. On the left, sloping lines indicated a hillside, and beyond was the white, winding ribbon of a descending path. Claude looked wonderingly at the drawing. He had heard of reporters who had taken down lengthy speeches verbatim, whilst they themselves were talking or half asleep, but this was the first time he had had a like experience. It was even a little eerie. He was certain he knew this place that he had drawn. To be sure, a hillside slope with a winding path was no uncommon conjunction, but there was still the peculiar feeling of instant recognition to be accounted for. Now where had he seen this place before? He cast his mind back over the walks of the last week, but could find no satisfactory answer. He tried then to get the face clear before him, just as it had appeared to him in his dreams. One thing was immediately apparent. The macabre scenery of the drawing had attached itself to the face. The artist laughed. This, he thought, would interest the little doctor who's always psychology mad. Then suddenly his laughter died away. A queer thought had come to him. It presented itself something like this. What if this woman is something more than a mere dream? What if, somewhere back in my experience, I have actually met her? What if, in some place that I half remember, she is really living? Now? The idea was startling. It took strong hold upon him, and he considered it carefully in all its bearings. He had, indeed, an undercurrent of sceptical thought. But the notion was so interesting that he would continue at least to play with it. All that morning he wondered over it. Even going to the trouble, though smilingly, of looking through an old album of family photographs. At the end of his otherwise fruitless endeavours, one thing at least appeared certain. Somewhere he had really seen that hillside slope and the descending path. When he was roused the next morning, he knew that he had had the dream again. He was dog-tired, and his whole body ached from top to toe. The August morning light that filtered through the Venetian blinds seemed to his mind to discover frowns and a squalid disorder in his bedroom. His clothes were strewn riotously about the room, and lying in different corners were his boots, thickly stained with chalk. Petulantly, he noticed, too, that he had left his door open, so that through it now ascended the sound of wakeful bustle in the kitchen. His throat was sore and parched, and his temples throbbed. That morning he could do no work. In the afternoon he went for his usual walk over the downs, and once again upon the lonely hills he pondered the problem of the dream. Half unconsciously, he turned his steps in the direction of a western spur, lying some two miles from the town. It was not one of his favourite walks, but he lacked energy for a climb into the lonelier and more beautiful uplands, and pursued indolently what for some reason proved to be the path of least resistance. Here the backs of mean cottages gave on to the sinuous track, and some miserable fowls scuttled before him, raising clouds of dust. Farther on and to the right, larger buildings threatened, an isolation hospital, and the straddling ugliness of a waterworks. Suddenly he remembered where he was. In a flash the sordid prospect about him became familiar. This was where he had walked two weeks or more ago, and straight before him waited the evil little valley. In another moment a further connection had made itself apparent. Later on, where the path dipped into the depression in the down, the view was exactly that of his later dreams. In the sudden shock of discovery, 
Claude found himself trembling with a strange excitement. He went on, walking rapidly. It was still hot, and he mopped his face with his handkerchief. In his rear, following more slowly, at a distance of several hundred yards, came slouching a farm hand, and at his heels a dog. Claude soon reached the parting in the ways where the lower track skirted the sloping ground that rose to the upland gallop on the left. It was here that the country of his dreams was set. There he saw the sombre hillside, and there the white path dipping downwards to the valley bottom. Without stopping he walked on quickly, and began with hurrying pulses to descend to the track. Behind him, coming at more moderate pace, lurched the labourer and his dog. Presently, on turning a sharpish bend, he saw below him the little hollow, pent in by the sides of the hill, and circled by a coarse and ragged growth of bramble. With the sight there came a vision hanging in his eyes of something foul and violent, something quick and furtive, done hurriedly, in an evil moment, amid the crowding obscenities of twilight, something that had happened, and he could half remember. A feeling of misgiving rose strong within him, and a perspiration broke out on his face and round his wrists. In the valley, partly covered by a tangle of gross plants, lay a rotting log, and behind it, screened by the rank weeds and bordered by the rude hedge of brambles, stretched a ditch. Here the coarse vegetation was bruised and dashed, and the smell of trampled nettles still hung, heavy, in the air, sick with nameless fear. Claude stopped in front of the spot and looked, fascinated, under the odorous litter of dying weed. The ground seemed to be scraped together in a heap, and here and there in the soil about the log were long, curving marks such as might be made by writhing feet. A horrid suspicion gained possession of his mind. He hesitated, trembling, half inclined to leave the place before the entry of the oncoming labourer. While he vacillated, the dog, now some little distance ahead of its master, came sniffing curiously along the ditch. In another moment it had reached the heap and stopped. Then suddenly, plunging down its head, the creature started scratching. It had come, first a shoe, and then a foot, and next the torn edges of a skirt appeared. Quickly now, the animal, in its excitement, turned to the other end of the huddled mass, and dragged away a heap of crumpled weed that hid what lay beneath. The afternoon sun, beating strongly down upon that evil scene, fell aslant the face of the labourer, stricken into bucolic terror by what he saw. It shone, too, into the staring eyes of Claude, pale blue marbles that fixed themselves in horror upon the sight of violence. He, the poor, nerve-wracked multiple, was looking with all the curious, almost detached intentness of a struck mind at what he had half expected to see, the face of the victim of his loving and homicidal other self. The woman he had murdered in his dreams. Drowsily, the flies were buzzing. Today's story was Proxy by John Metcalf. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. If you enjoy the show, why not become a patron on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content? It's the surest way to help me keep creating. 
you can also buy me a coffee. Like, subscribe, comment, share, follow on social media, and read the description for more information about the show and how you can engage with it. Until next time, sweet dreams.